Hello there, students. In this video, we're going to talk about the basic building blocks of racket programs, which are functions, forms, and expressions. Let me begin by saying that this is the first video that's going to have an associated reading. So the associated reading is going to be SIGP sections 1.1.1 and 2. They're pretty short. I hope you'll read them. They'll be linked in the description. So when we specify what programming languages are, we give two sets of rules. We specify the syntax and the semantics. The syntax specifies the rules and constraints that guide what kinds of input strings constitute valid programs. So basically, they define the syntax, the sort of um, textual forms that are inherent to the language. So for example, C includes statements. Those statements are separated by semicolons and formed into blocks. And then they can be formed in things like loops and stuff like that. Now, one characteristic that makes Racket really unique is that it has an extremely uniform syntax. It's a very, very sparse uh, syntax. There are not very many basic syntactic forms. So you can learn Racket without too much work. In fact, we've already seen a significant amount of it. So you can get by in Racket just using a few basic forms that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. Now, this week, we're going to focus just on the core of the language mentioning but largely ignoring function definitions. So we're going to show you how to do them, but we're really going to focus on the meat of function definitions uh, sort of starting next week. Now, of course, functions are the heart of any functional programming language, and Racket is a functional programming language. But I've often found it to be the case that students get tripped up on some basic concepts and terminology, and that it's going to be important as we start to grapple with those more complex concepts to just have some basic terms down. Okay, so along with the language's syntax, we also have the part that is sort of my interest, and I hope will become yours, which is the semantics. And that's what programs actually mean. The syntactic stuff is largely superficial, but understanding what programs actually mean involves a whole bunch of kind of nuanced and complicated reasoning. And there are a whole bunch of different ways to set up semantics mathematically, or just sort of specifying how the program operates by writing a virtual machine for it, which is something that we'll do later in the semester. Now, similarly to understanding natural languages like English, I think it's fair to say that most programmers develop an intuition for the semantics of a the language that they use just by writing example programs and running them. And that is precisely what we're going to do in this course as well. But in next lecture, we're actually going to talk about how we might start to pin down some of those ideas and how we might start to formally and mathematically represent them. So stick around for that, but for now we're going to discuss some of the key ideas in Racket forms. Uh, as I mentioned back, Racket's uh, use of syntax is extremely economical among programming languages out there. So most of the forms or most of the pieces of a language are expressions. An expression is any piece of the syntactic, uh, sorry, any syntactic piece of the language that computes a value. So anything that I can point to in the program and say, well, that computes the value 23, or that computes some function, that's, a, uh, that's an expression. So this lecture includes a few really key ideas I hope you'll remember, not just in Rapid, but also in other languages. The first is the notion of an expression, and uh, everything that goes along with that, so the notion that expressions can include sub-expressions. And the second is an example of a call site, or sorry, the second is a concept of call site, which is just the syntactic location at which point a function is called. So these are both terms that I think are important to know just for general computing competency, but maybe more importantly for you, uh, I think they're things that people really care about when you, for example, interview for jobs and if you're talking about uh, programs in, in a new language. They're kinds of the sorts of terms you would really want to know when you start going about that work. All right, so let's jump into it. Now, in Racket, a form is just some piece of recognized syntax in the language. So, for example, if and and are both forms, but plus and list refer to functions. So, a function is anything that you can call with arguments. And forms are not necessarily functions. They define higher level constructs that you can build by using expressions and other building blocks. Now, the Racket language actually defines a bunch of core forms for you, although the main one is calling a function. However, there are a bunch of other ones like it, and, and you can even define your own forms too using Racket's macro system. We'll talk a little bit about this later on in the class, but we probably won't mention it too much. 
In general, scheme-like languages, Racket is a scheme descendant, prefer to give a small number of general forms that then allow you to get really good work done rather than a bunch of precise forms. All right, so let's look back at Dr. Racket and we'll look at some examples of some of these forms. We've already seen some uh, forms from last lecture. 3 plus 2 is a function call form. This means apply the plus function to arguments 3 and 2. We can run that program and we get 5. In last lecture, I said, if you're confused by this, remember you can think of this as sort of taking the function right here and then using that and calling it and interspersing commas between the different arguments. So this is what the above looks like in a C-like language. And if that looks weird to you still, imagine that you might be able to rename the plus identifier uh, just with the word plus, for example. All right. Let's look at some other ones. So we've also got the if form. So if takes uh, three different arguments. They're not really arguments. They're more of, uh, well, I guess things after the word if. So the form has uh, three different subforms. So there's the guard. There's the expression to evaluate if the guard is true. And there's the expression to evaluate if the guard is false. So let's just say um, if false, then evaluate to 12. Otherwise, evaluate to string hello. One thing that you can see is kind of interesting here already. In Racket, it's totally OK if the different kinds of the branches have different types of their results. So that's totally fine. Let's run this program and see what we get. And we get back the string hello. All right. Racket has a procedure named equal huh, which checks for structural equality. So I can check is uh, 2 plus 4 and uh, 3 plus 3 equal. And it is, so Racket prints 12. I can even do even more of these and see if these things are all equal, but it won't let me do that because the equal ha huh function expects that I will just give it two separate arguments. So there are some functions in Racket that I can call with a variadic number of arguments. And in fact, plus is one of them. So I can do plus equal on plus one, one, one. Is that equal to three? See what I did right here? I messed up my, uh, I messed up my parentheses. This parentheses was meant to only close up to here, but I noticed in Dr. Racket, it's telling me now there's something hanging off over here. So this parentheses is unclosed. You'll see this happen a lot, and you'll get into the habit of realizing uh, when to sort of make your code so you do the right thing. And so right here, I can see they're both in full. All right. Now, if is not a function. Let's see precisely why if it's not a function. And this is one of the first sort of uh, non-obvious things that you might think. So we're going to define a function f that takes two arguments, x and y. And we're going to say this function just returns its first argument, x. Now, I haven't talked too much about function definitions yet. So let me explain precisely what this function definition does. This says, define a function named f with two named arguments, x and y. And then the body of the function simply returns x. Now, because I included two separate uh, arguments, whenever I actually call that function, I have to make sure that I include two actual arguments. So when I press the Run button right here, Racket builds a what is called environment. The environment maps values or names, uh, sorry, names of things to their actual values. 
So let's explain one mystifying thing that we haven't talked about so far, this pound lane racket. Pound lane racket is actually one of the few mystical things in the language. This pound lane racket line tells the racket language system to use the full version of the racket programming language. Now, there are a whole bunch of other different languages you can use. For the most part, they're variants of Racket, although you can write extremely different ones here, and you can even build your own language. Now, during this entire course, we are going to use Pound Lane Racket, which imports all of the core forms for the language, including the definitions of things like define, if, and and, but you could consider radically different uh, languages, some of which define new forms or maybe have the traditional forms like function application performing totally different kinds of semantics. And if you're interested in that, let me know and we can talk about macros sometime. All right, so I'm gonna run this, I'm gonna load it up, I'm gonna call F with one and two, and it's gonna return one because that's the first argument to that. All right, now we wanted to illustrate why if was a form rather than just a function. So let's start to do that. Let's say I can define another function named uh, foo of x. And this function foo of x is just going to call foo, it's just going to call itself with the same argument. So if I think about how this function might work, it's a recursive function and it's really just going to loop around and around and around. And if I try to run it, it's probably gonna crash, right? Because it's never gonna terminate. So let's think about how this executes. If I go to foo 10, that's gonna be then equal to foo 10 and then foo 10. I can sort of think about substituting definitions back in. That's the concept that we're gonna talk about in the next lecture. All right, so we can try to start uh, executing it and it's never going to stop. So we can manually uh, hit it right here. And Dr. Racket will say where it got stuck. All right. So it turns out we actually don't need X right here. Racket will allow us to have zero argument functions, right? So if I define foo like this, I'm not defining the name foo, I'm defining a function named foo with no arguments that always evaluates the one. So if I run this right here, I can type foo. And remember, if this looks confusing, remember in a C-like language, the C-like equivalent, it would be this, right? Which is something that you see all the time in C-like languages. All right. And then I can get my old program back by just saying foo. And let's rename this to something more sensible now. We're gonna rename it now notice something interesting even though this function loop will run forever i can still define it there's nothing that stops me from just defining the function all right it's only when i execute the function that i run into trouble so just having the name loop in the environment if i just type loop it'll say all right there's a function name i actually have to call it to see the diverging behavior All right, so now let's see why is if a form and not a function? Well, here's precisely why. I might say if equal, huh, two plus three and four plus one. Oops, I guess old habits die hard. I'm gonna say if two plus three and four plus one are equal, then we're going to evaluate to the symbol tick hello. If not, we're going to loop forever. Now, this computes to five. This computes to five. So these things should be equal, and thus I should get hello. And I should never step into this sort of like minefield right here. Once I step into this piece of code, I'm never going to return. So let's see what happens. Well, it computes to hello. All right, well, let's see what happens if I change this to be a three. Well, as expected, now the code never loops. All right, well, now let's go back to our other function over here. 
And let's replace this with uh, let's replace this with true because this evaluates to true, right? So that will allow us to make our if statement here a little bit tighter. So now if here evaluates to true, and then hello. Otherwise, if it's false, which it's not, it'll loop forever. Now, no, I could have a function. If. I might write if as a function. Let's call it if uh, if f. Now I'm going to have uh, let's say guard true and then false. We can just use the names because we already have hash t and hash f. Well, I might try doing something like this. I might try saying something like if guard true false. Now I've defined this function. If as a function, I'm going to put a hyphen right here so we don't confuse it with if and only if. But let's see what happens if I do if hyphen f p hello and then loop. Now, this right here is a call to the if form. It's not a call, but it's an expansion to the if form. So it's a use of the if form. Right here, this is a call of the if hyphen f function. Now they should do the same thing, except we're going to see when I just run the first one, I get tick hello. But when I run the second one, because this is a function, Racket is going to do something interesting. It's going to try to evaluate all of the arguments to that function, because Racket is what's called a call by value language. And thus, this call never terminates. Because this call to loop right here, to actually get the values of the arguments to if f, will force the evaluation of this loop, which will then never terminate. All right, so we've seen that this first use of if right here, this behaves like a form, because it doesn't evaluate this right-hand side unless it actually ends up being used. Because the true branch is used, we never evaluate the false branch. And that's one consequence of the fact that if is a form rather than a function. When I sort of mimic if's behavior as a form by defining a function, I kind of force this call right here to be a function call because I'm calling the function if dash f. And so I'm forcing myself to evaluate all the arguments. All right, so now let's talk about values and expressions. Every language has a set of what is called values. Values are the primitive pieces of data that can be represented by the language at runtime. Expressions are pieces of the language that evaluate down to values. So some examples of values are things like numbers and strings, but also, as we'll see, functions who at runtime are named closures because you actually need to keep some more information. You probably know a similar kind of thing from another kind of programming language called an object. In object-oriented programming languages, objects are values. And in particular, for example, in JavaScript, an object is a value. Not the only kind of value, but it's one very important kind of value along with the kind of values. Now, in programming languages, we say that an expression is any form that evaluates to a value. This is a very important term to know. Often in class, I will talk about an expression. An expression of the language is just some piece of syntax that evaluates down to a value. So it's just any use of a form. It's any, it's any, uh, any syntax that evaluates down to a value. All right, so now here's time for an exercise. Which of the following things are expressions? So is define x23 an expression? So let's go back and look at our definition of expressions. An expression is any piece of syntax that evaluates down to a value. So does this evaluate to a value? Well, it updates the environment to include a value for x, but it doesn't actually evaluate to a value. By the way, even though we've defined functions, you can also define names like this as well. So I could go here and I could say define x is 23. 
Now, when I run the program, if I type X, I get 23 loaded into the environment. All right. What about just X? Well, X has a value. It has to be looked up in the environment. That's something that we'll talk about over the next few lectures. But it does result in a value, assuming that X has an actual binding, which is a little bit of a trickiness. But we'll call that an expression. This is a call site. So this, is, uh, this entire expression is a point at which the function plus is being called. And that makes this a call site, along with a function application form. This next one is another definition. So unlike the last one, which this call site resulted in the value of x plus 3, whatever x was, it will result in that plus 3. So if x is 2, x plus 3, this will result in the value 5. But unlike that, this define form does not generate a value. It just defines a name. What about if? Well, if does generate a value. So for example, no matter what we get at the end of the day, either if X is true or false, we're either going to generate whatever is generated by foo or whatever value is generated by bar, right? So both of those have to be expressions as well. All right, so X is a value, or sorry, an expression, generates a value when it's evaluated by the language. So is x plus 3. That's also an expression. It evaluates to some value. So is if x, who x, bar x. All right, now let's go through two basic exercises in Dr. Rapid. The first exercise asks us to define a function that takes an argument x and returns x times 2 if x is greater than 0, or returns x times negative 2 otherwise. So let's copy and paste this definition over into Dr. Rapid. So that's what we're trying to do. All right, so let's define two of x. And we're going to say, if x is greater than 0, then we need to return x times 2. So that's going to be x times 2. Otherwise, we return x times negative 2. Uh, we could write negative 2 times x because of this simple fact about arithmetic. So let's test it and see. All right, seems to work. So then let's go back and look at our other challenge. Now we are going to define a function that takes an argument x and returns x divided by 2 if it's even, or x times 3 plus 1 if it's odd. So let's take this function and try to implement this. Right. So we're going to define bar x, and we also have this hint. The hint says use equals and modulo to check if x is even or odd. So we can use mod to see whether x is even or odd. So we're going to say if, so when is x even? It's even when x mod 2 is equal to 0. So equal uh, 0 mod uh, modulo x2. Now I can never remember what the name of modulo is, so let's see if it's mod or modulo. We can start typing here. Let's see. Okay, there's a procedure. What about mod? Okay, so mod couldn't be defined. Right, so we're going to say, if x mod 2 is equal to 0, then we need to return x divided by 2. Otherwise, we need to return um, 3 times x plus 1. So we'll do add 1 of 3 times x. This function add 1 simply adds 1 to its argument. You could equally well write plus 1. But I kind of like to use add 1 once in a while. All right, let's look at bar. 
bar two is one, bar one is four, bar four is two, bar two is one. Hmm. Well, it turns out that actually this function is named the Colox function. And a very famous unsolved problem in mathematics relates to the convergence of this function. You might have seen when we tried bar two, if we kept successively applying the result, we would eventually get down to one. That always happens, no matter what. So let's try some numbers. Bar five, bar 16, bar eight, bar four, bar two, we get one. What happens if we start with bar seven? bar 22, bar 11, bar 34, bar 16. Well, I think you see there this is going because we've already seen this happen. Bar four, bar two, we get down to one. Now, if you can prove this is always happens, no matter which end you start with, you will have solved one of the world's most uh, ancient challenges uh, that's been longstanding in mathematics. We all believe that this will always happen and yet no one has proved it. So that's, that concludes the lecture for today. Uh, see if you can go through the Tolax conjecture, I guess.